Okay, so hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the Unhappy Hour. I'm VN Times editor Rachel Buzzle. And I'm James Wesco. I'm the editor of Vet Times. Um, just a message from our sponsors. This happy hour is brought to you in association with Bought by Many, voted Pet Insurance Provider of the Year at the 2021 Money Facts Consumer Awards. They work with vet nurses and owners to help pets have happy and healthy lives. So join their Many Nurses Club on Facebook to connect with other nurses and get a £50 Amazon gift card when you take out a bought by many policy all of their policies cover conditions that ended at least two years ago and they have a policy that can cover most recent conditions so visit their website at boughtbymany.com to find out more about their award-winning cover. Okay, so firstly, thank you all for joining us at our new time. Um, we've been listening to your feedback, so we thought we'd give this new time a test drive. So make sure you let us know if this is working for you at the end of the event. Um, we're back for 2022 with a cracking event for you. It's a good one, I promise. Um, tonight, we will be discussing everything around breed health and healthy breeding, including the VN's role in supporting breeders, as well as owners on the pre-purchase journey. Yeah, it should be a cracking event, and we're really excited to be to welcome uh, RVN Catherine Wrigley to Happy Hour, who'll be joining me in the interview hot seat. Uh, Catherine has a keen interest in canine reproduction and completed her dog breeding diploma in 2010. Um, she's a Kennel Club Assured Breeder and Breed Health Coordinator for Gordon Setters. In practice, Catherine is keen to promote responsible breeding and enjoys supporting novice breeders. She has run a successful antenatal clinic and as a trained pregnancy scanner, believes she is in a position to advise and support breeders throughout the breeding process. Yep, and joining Catherine, uh, she will be joined on our expert panel with RVN Chloe McIntosh. Uh, Chloe is head veterinary nurse at PDSA Romford, um, and she has a passion for all things charity and shelter medicine. Uh, Chloe also enjoys educating owners on preventive medicine, as well as the responsibility of maintaining breed standard health. And she will be starting a master's in molecular biology in September. Sounds like a lot of work, but um, and and joining Catherine and Chloe will be a happy hour all star uh, RVN Lacey Pitcher back with us again. Uh, Lacey's passionate about public education and communication. She has worked alongside rescues for a number of years and has a particular interest in brachycephalic breeds given their increased welfare needs. Lacey works out of hours in emergency care alongside her role at the RCVS. Oh, what a panel indeed. So we can't wait to chat with you all. Uh, but before we get started, we need to remind you of the prizes up for grabs tonight. Um, tonight for a chance to win a £50 voucher. That's right, 50 whole pounds. Uh, we want you to share us your pictures of happy, healthy pets. Doesn't matter what it is. So get your phones out, guys. Um, I think Rachel's going to share you the email address to send those to. But send them in for a chance to win 50 quid. Yeah, so we want to see your pets living their best life. So send your happy pet pictures to happyhour at bbd.co.uk for your chance to win that £50 voucher. And it's fitting we've got Lacey on with us again tonight because this is her concept. Uh, she kindly allowed us to use this. And so we will be naming the winner of this month's Pay It Forward prize announcing and also announcing the two winners of our mega popular Top Tips competition. Sorry, Rachel, who uses the word mega anymore? You wrote, Sorry, I can tell you wrote I this. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's not all. We also are welcoming back Quizmaster Jack Pye, and he will be getting all of our cogs wearing during the quiz breakout session. Um, so get your emails open, your notepads ready. Uh, the person with the highest score to win Jack's quiz, which is just going to be absolutely amazing. He's assured me it's going to be even better than ever, which is some benchmark. Um, so get those out. Um, Rachel, with a bit more details on that. Yep, so all we've got to do is send your answers again to happyhour at bbd.co.uk. Make sure you get them over to us before the cutoff of 9.15 for your chance to win. Um, and just before we get started, guys, Happy Hour is all about you guys. So um, if you're feeling shy and you don't want to put something in the main thread, feel free to uh, direct message myself, Rachel, um, Ebony or Remy um, and we can post on your behalf or answer any questions also get on the social media at hashtag VN happy hour yeah right then so should we get started I think we will um, so are you ready hi Catherine how's it going 
Hi there. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you. Good stuff. Don't sound too nervous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've had we've stacks of, of, of uh, great questions come in from our regular happy hour punters. So uh, I'll kick off with this one. So um, can you tell us a bit about your career journey? Where did your passion for healthy breeding and breed health come from? OK, so both my parents are vets, so I grew up in a veterinary environment. I um, spent all um, my school holidays at the vets, so that was an interest that started really early. When I left school, I actually worked in a busy boarding kennel, which was also a breeding and show kennel, so I carried on with my love of dogs there. And then I did want to get into vet nursing, and I eventually got the chance from volunteering at my local vets on a Saturday and then I got the trainee position that was back in 2003 and I qualified in 2005. Um, my mum, as a youngster, had always wanted a Gordon setter. Um, when I was three years old, she got our first one, Emily. And because of her clients who were breeders, um, they used to come into the clinic and talk about their show experiences. Mum got interested and decided when she got our Gordon, we'd show her, which we did. And then from there, the breeding goes on. So as a youngster, I've grown up with um, breeding and showing the dog. So that's really where the passion came from mm -hmm. very early on. Um, so obviously a very experienced breeder yourself, which leads us nicely into our next question. So in your opinion, what is the best way to start conversations with novice or first time breeders? I guess not everyone's got that wealth of experience. No, um, I think don't assume for a start what why they are breeding. We can all make assumptions as to why people want to breed dogs. Um, so be honest and ask them. Um, some, particularly in the current uh, climate we live in, might be motivated by money. And if that's the case, then steer the conversation for do they actually realise how much it's going to cost to do the job properly. Um, but just really find out what their motivation is, what they're actually expecting. Um, and I know from speaking to uh, novice breeders, once you start talking about it, there's something that they haven't even thought about and it's not quite what they thought. So just have that honest conversation. Don't be judgmental, but just let, you know, let them tell you what they're thinking. And then obviously you can guide the conversation around that. Yeah, I mean, do, do you find that um, someone who may be motivated for other reasons, I know this is a little extra question, I just, I yeah, just had a thought, okay. <laughs> is, is, it, is it easy to, I mean, once people have actually properly explained what, once you've explained an expert exactly what's involved, do you, do you find that people are, are prepared to accept that and think, no, yeah. that's not the route? Certainly when I started, I started doing antenatal clinics about 2008, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'd have people that, I'd already got a pregnant bitch and then were panicking because they didn't know what to do. But often I had many people that were just thinking about it. And sometimes an hour with me was enough to actually put them off. Mm -hmm. That, you know, there was lots of things that they hadn't thought of because there is a risk to the bitch. And that's sometimes something that people forget. Um, so once you actually start to question them on how much do they really want this, um, then, yes, yeah, some of them do actually just change their minds and go that that wasn't what I thought it was and I'm not going to do it. Others, on the other hand, listen to what you've got to say and then want to do it properly, which is mm -hmm. what we want to see. Yeah. Yeah. It's just making sure that advice is there for them. Yeah. And I guess they could, you can't uh, force people to, but uh, nope. our next question is a good one as well. Um, do you think that uh, because many breeders don't find veterinary practices approachable, uh, the profession at large is in some way culpable for the number of fertility practices that we're seeing springing up everywhere? This, this is a really good question. And I found having a foot in both camps, um, sometimes a little bit of wariness on both sides from vets and breeders um, around that. I think sometimes vets that aren't, and nurses that aren't very experienced with breeders are sometimes a little bit intimidated by them. Um, generally, you know, breeders like myself, we're very passionate about our breed. We know a lot about it. And when confronted with that, you know, you might not feel that you have that knowledge. Also, I don't think there's an awful lot of training for vets on normal reproduction, you know, a normal welking. We only tend to see them when there's a problem. Mm -hmm. um so i think that sort of lack of confidence in that area sometimes just puts the barriers up that you know some veterinary professionals would rather not bother um with breeders and obviously breeders are looking for a practice that 
helps them. You know, you might not be able to do all the things um, that they maybe need, but that, you know, they, they want to come to the practice. So therefore they might well choose these other places that are giving them the services that they want. Mm -hmm. And I mean, leading on from that question, I mean, how can we mitigate clients' use of unlicensed pet fertility clinics? I mean, I think they're rare, I hope, thankfully, but I mean, we know, uh, I hear at the Vet Times and Rachel does at the End Times that these things are going on. And what, what, can, what can you guys, what can the nurses do to, to help okay. in that situation? So I think just be a bit more breeder friendly, even if that's one point of contact within the practice. You might not have the answer that the breeder is asking you. Um, you might not do the service. So maybe something like progesterone testing. Instead of just saying, no, we don't do that. How about saying, OK, but we'll find you somewhere reputable that can do that for you. Because I think some of the problems with um, some of the fertility clinics, you know, they've got lay people taking blood and things like that. So that's where we have a problem. Um, and ideally we want to, you know, make sure that breeders are getting the best service from the people that are actually qualified to do that. And, you know, on the whole, that's that's the veterinary profession. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, how do you raise concerns with inverted commas old school breeders who may feel they have been in the field long enough to not know uh, to not want to take on new recommendations or advice I mean, you alluded this to this to this earlier Catherine about perhaps and that it might be quite intimidating dealing with those sort of people yeah. as well yeah I, I love this this is a really good question and um you know whether we're in the veterinary profession or breeders there's probably old school of everybody um I personally don't think that many of the old school breeders perhaps as detrimental as some of the newer breeding practices that are coming through. However, um, somebody that's been breeding for 40, 50, even 60 years, some of their practices may be a little outdated. However, if they've been successfully raising happy and healthy dogs, why would they want to change? Um, but there may be something, you know, we've all heard of, you know, they must feed the puppy an egg at one o'clock and all these sorts of things. So there might be something that you want to change. But what I would really um, ask people to do is those breeders, um, acknowledge that they have got a lot of knowledge. Um, and, you know, I think if you go in in a critical way, the barriers are going to go up. Whereas if you're interested in that breeder and the dogs that they breed, um, make it a, a better conversation and then maybe you can add things in there so one of the things I'd like to point out is over the years I've been asked to do lots of breeder talks um, with all different breeds not sometimes I personally know people other times I don't and when I walk into um, a room full of breeders I and particularly probably because I'm younger than a lot of them I'm sure they must think oh yes what's this person going to tell me but I'm respectful of them, the fact that they have been doing it a long time. Um, it's a two-way conversation. I don't stand and talk at them. I ask for their opinions and to share their experiences. And usually I get a great deal out of that. I, I go away learning things as well. And, um, you know, one talk that I did, I remember the organiser actually came up to me afterwards and said, I didn't tell you this before, but this room is full of very top experienced readers. I wasn't quite sure how you were going to be received but they handed out a feedback form and all these lovely breeders had given me 10 out of 10 they'd enjoyed the talk and that made me feel good that you know we we got to an understanding <laughs> mm -hmm. and you I suppose you hit on it there really at all stages of a breeder's journey or levels of experience it's having it's going into those dialogues prepared to have a two-way conversation to listen as well as to speak I suppose not always easy anyway that's my uh, my next question. Uh, how do you raise concerns? No, that's the last question. Uh, do you think practices um, and report enough C-sections to the KC or are any surgery that changes the confirmation of a KC registered dog? And what can VNs do to improve this? OK, so this, again, is a really interesting question. And I know in our practice, when a cesarean is walking through the door, you're not necessarily thinking about the paperwork you need to do or you need to alert the kennel club or, or whatever. And I know some practices maybe feel uncomfortable with that if they're breaking that bond they have with the client or whatever. 
So I actually asked the um, Kennel Club health team on this because I wasn't sure, to be honest, who actually does report cesareans. I know I definitely see them reported in the breed supplement, but I wasn't sure who was doing that. So they just actually gave me some figures, which I'd just like to share with you, if that's OK. Please do. Please do. Um, so in 2019, there was 6,329 cesareans reported to the Kennel Club. 0.2% of those were reported by vets. 98.4% was actually breeders that had reported them, and 0.7% was both the vets and the breeder had reported. So I think it does show uh, the veterinary profession, for whatever reason, you know, are not reporting them. Again, I think it might be sort of difficulties on how you report it, because usually to um, inform the Kennel Club of things, you need the registration number of the dog, we don't tend to have that information. Um, we only know the dog as its pet name. Um, we don't know what its, its show name is or anything. But the Kennel Club actually say they can use a microchip details and the surname of the owner is, is fine. If anybody is concerned about um, reporting it, both the BVA and the Kennel Club websites both go through that on how to do it and actually regarding the client confidentiality when you register a dog with the kennel club when you sign the declaration it does actually include reporting cesareans and any surgery that alters confirmation so actually that permission is already there so that might make you know um vets and nurses feel a bit better about doing that yeah, I mean, that's really interesting information because I think that is one area. It's a very grey area for um, for vet practices. Um, but um, we're, we're uh, fast running out of time. So um, I'll move on to my next question is, should practices routinely offer C-sections for breeders? Nice, easy one for you to field, uh, Catherine. <laughs> I think that's a real <laughs> tricky one. So as a breeder, I would be thinking, I personally wouldn't want to have a breed that is looking at elective cesareans. However, in the veterinary profession, I think we have um, a duty of welfare. And if these bitches are likely to need an elective cesarean or they're likely to need cesarean because they get into difficulties, I think taking the safety and welfare of the bitch is paramount. And I don't think turning them away or not wanting to deal with them is probably the answer because where are they going to end up? Um, you know, they, they could end up at, you know, somewhere that we don't want them to be so I think we almost have to leave our thoughts and ethics of breeding out of that for a moment and actually deal with the situation that we've got with us um, I think though if practices are feeling uncomfortable and they don't want to get in this routine of continually doing elective cesareans is obviously they can talk to the owner about how many they'll actually do and you know whether they consider spaying after maybe one certainly two um but yeah i don't i don't think we can shut the door on them i think we we need to be we're in the best position to look after these um which is you know whether we actually agree with how they've got there in the first place good answer um this is another good question how do you feel the pandemic and subsequent hike in puppy prices stroke design across breeds has impacted on the number of inexperienced breeders uh, you're seeing in practice <laughs> Um, huge impact. So basically, we've always had people that wanted to breed for different reasons, but suddenly we had a massive amount of people that had never considered breeding, looking at their nice little dog sitting on the settee and thinking, oh, you know, we can make a few thousand here if that's what puppies are going for. The other flip side to that was um, I actually spoke to a number of people that didn't want to pay three or four thousand pounds for a puppy. Um, they loved their own dog, so they actually decided, I'm going to have a litter from that and, and keep that puppy myself. But obviously, that means there are other, there are other puppies there as well. Um, so it definitely increased. Um, I mean, I know that as a scanner. I mean, my business went crazy with the amount of people that were breeding. And one more thing that I also saw, which really upset me during that time, was there was quite a few bitches coming in from abroad who were already pregnant and they were being sold for higher prices because they were pregnant um, and people were just buying a pregnant bitch so that they've got the puppies ready to be sold. Mm, tough, tough stuff to see, I think. Um, final question. This is a nice question. Do you have any advice for a young nurse looking to become a champion for good breed health at their practice? 
sure yeah. you've got loads. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really, really good attitude to have um, to get involved with that. So first thing to realise or you know, think about is that there are a lot of breeders out there who are extremely passionate about health and welfare and spend a lot of their spare time um, learning about health and going to seminars and, and doing all those sorts of things. Make yourself aware of the breed um, health testing and schemes that are available. Many of these are available for crossbreeds as well. Um, so don't just think because it's a crossbreed, it can't participate in a health test. Um, and a great point of contact, which um, you know, you've already mentioned, I'm a breed health coordinator for my breed. Every breed has a person like me doing that. So they are more than happy for you to contact them, ask them about maybe a specific um, health condition in that breed, or health testing that's available, um, or any re research programs that are going on. So anything you want to know about a particular thing, there will be a breed health coordinator or the Kennel Club health team that will be able to help you and um, you know let you, let you find out how you can do that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. Some real nuggets in there. Um, excellent interview, and I'm pleased to say you will be joining chloe and lacy for our panel discussion shortly um we're now going to do a brief three question poll um which um i've been told not to touch because um i have uh, broken in the past so we'll have three quick fire questions for you guys coming up but um while that's happening just remind you to, we've had lots of challenge entries coming in so keep those coming in to uh, to rachel but uh, here's the first well here are the questions so uh, does your practice routinely offer elective c-sections for breeders does your practice offer discounts to breeders and do you think it should be obligatory for all dogs undergoing corrective surgery to be neutered at the same time i'm sure that will there'll be quite devices on there but we'll give you a few uh, a few seconds to get into those um but as i say make sure you uh keep sending in those challenge pictures we've had some pretty good ones so yeah, far we've got we, some lovely pictures coming in and um, just to remind you the email address is happy hour at bbd.co.uk so yeah get those phones if uh, if you haven't already we've all, i might i might enter but i don't think i'm eligible for the prize <laughs> am i rachel i've got uh, you know you can't win james i've got some great pet pictures on my phone <laughs> obviously just a reminder we've got jack's quiz coming up soon as well but before that we've got a an excellent panel chat that we've uh, we've both been looking forward to haven't we rachel yeah yeah can't wait <clears throat> so we'll give this a few more minutes i think we're getting there on these though um interesting split most not on the routinely elective c-sections mm. What have you got there? You've got 90% saying yeah. no to the first question so far. So does your practice routinely offer elective C-sections of breeders? So it's no. Uh, your second question is 70% saying no to does your practice offer discounts to breeders? And so far you have almost a 50-50 split to say, do you think it should be obligatory for all dogs undergoing uh, corrective surgery to be neutered at the same time? Okay. And I guess it's nuanced because we've got Amy just popping in there. I've said no, but definitely should be on a case by case basis. So uh, that's probably fair enough, Amy, I think. Um, right, that's pretty much stopped doing anything now. So should we, um, should we move into our panel discussion, okay, do you think, Rachel? Into the panel discussion, yeah. Okay. Uh, final reminder for the challenge, though, because we don't want anyone to miss out. That's easy <laughs> money, that is. Um, Okay, right. Having come off the hot seat for the main interview, it's you first, Catherine. So you ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give you a few seconds to draw breath. Yeah. Um, so how, I mean, this is, this is a, a fairly terse question, but how are we looking forward, how are we looking to move forward to reverse the damage caused already? I mean, it's quite a controversial question. You may want to rephrase that, but I mean, I think I know what they're getting at. Yeah, I think, um, unfortunately, we're in a worse position than we were previously pandemic so we've had for years maybe things creeping in um you know like i suppose the fertility clinics and more ai and perhaps animals that weren't being or well, couldn't breed are breeding um but i think the pandemic has definitely taken us back and i also worry a little bit because when you hear 
of bad things happening, I think that divides the veterinary profession and the breeders again. And there are many responsible breeders out there who are still doing what they were doing, but all these other things now have just swamped it and it probably gives everybody um, a, a bad name. So I think we need to carry on educating puppy buyers on how to buy responsibly. Um, I think we need to support responsible breeders. Um, and I think there's slight indications, you know, puppy prices have gone back down a little bit. And, you know, some people are actually being left with puppies that they haven't been able to sell, which is worrying for them. But perhaps it might make people think it's not quite as easy. You know, you've got to have a market to sell to. So, yeah, I've, I've been worried throughout the pandemic. And I think we've probably still got some bumpy times ahead, particularly as pandemic dogs are being bred and some of them were quite poorly socialized etc so i think we've got a few more problems to come unfortunately mm. over to you rach thank you james um i'm coming over to you lacy so how do you feel about the breed ban for cavalier king charles spaniels and british bulldogs in norway oh that's one to unpack isn't it yeah. so for anyone in the room that doesn't know i share my life with a brachycephalic dog she is my world. Um, she is a rescue. And I feel like I have to say all the time, oh, she's a rescue. Even if I'm locoming and I'm going into a vet clinic, I've almost got to put a disclaimer on the fact that I share my life with her. Now, she is a better example of the breed, but by no means healthy, because she's still a brachycephalic dog with poor conformation compared to some of the more agile dogs. Now, do I think that a complete ban is going to encourage open communication probably not but that is something that i feel really really strongly about i think when we look at education i am more likely to ask someone for help who i feel it doesn't necessarily have to have the same opinion as me but will meet me as an equal and i just worry that a ban as we've seen with several other conformational problems a ban doesn't always fix the problem, it just pushes it underground. And actually, if we push something underground, do we have any control over what happens with it? So I feel that personally, I, I've never lived in that country. I don't know how society, our culture and everything is and how that education would be met, but I do live here. And I have worked in this profession for a long time to know that actually, I don't feel that that would work here right now. I do think we have a lot of work to do and we need to get work done. But I think for me, that comes from better education and regulating breeding, not banning it. I think when we ban it, we stand the risk of, of creating a much, much bigger problem. Um, but that is just my opinion. Um, I still very much love my dogs. Would I breed from them? No. Thank you, Lacey. It's a great answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, this one's for you, Chloe. Um, how are we looking to teach the younger generation and what is expected to be uh, normal and abnormal? For example, pets being bred to have blue coats. Um, I can also throw in hairless bulldogs as a <laughs> recent story we've had in vet <laughs> times. And how, how more people can recognise that any pet with a squished face is abnormal. Um, and again, that's quite a controversial question in the way it's worded but um yeah I'll let you uh, tackle that one yeah so it probably is quite a controversial topic but to be honest I think just reiterating what Catherine and Lacey said about meeting somebody as an equal and having an open conversation with them you always catch more bees with honey than you do with vinegar if you go in all guns blazing to somebody and try to explain the negative impact about arguably what is something they really love and think of quite highly you're probably not going to be met very well so I think just meeting them as an equal discussing it in a really positive manner and just explain you want what's best for them and their animal and probably just debunking some of the what is expected as normal now so for example bulldogs falling asleep with toys in their mouth everyone thinks it's cute oh they're lazy actually you know they're doing it because they can't breathe so just explaining to people, because it's not because they're stupid, they just don't know. But there's so much, um, I guess that's what a lot of this conversation about is about owning that conversation, or at least the veterinary profession, the vet nursing profession, having that conversation, rather than people turning to social media or, or the internet in general, isn't it really? It is about owning that conversation. 
Oh, we've got Lacey. Lacey, are you wanting to add something there? Yeah, I just just to reiterate, if um, uh, I had a, we'll call it a conversation with someone the other week in a vet practice, and they said, you know, who are you to say that this is wrong? And I said, no, you're completely right. Who who am I? I'm just a normal person with an opinion asking for us to to discuss it. If I walked into a consult room and someone didn't know I was a veterinary professional, as you know, now I'm not always in a clinical setting, I'm a client. And if I go in and feel judged from the moment I get there, am I likely to stay? Am I likely to voice my concerns in the same way? Probably not. Am I going to respect the person in front of me, even though they are educated and have put a lot of work into what they've done? Probably not. And I just think that maybe we start when we start trying to think about where people are coming from, we might actually stand more of a chance of making welfare improvements. It might not be right, but at least it's a star. Thank you, Chloe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I think as well, just trying to show that you're on, it's always a thing, isn't it? It's always a thing between it's the client and the vet nurse, it's the client and the vet, and it's a divide. Whereas if you come to them and you say, we don't want you to end up in in an area where you're financially impacted, you're upset with the loss of your animal, you're, you don't know what to do or how to move forward. So for example, things like breeding blue animals when that's probably not what they're meant to look like. All they know is what's cute, what's young, what's been put out on social media. If you then explain, that's great, they look fantastic at that age. In two to three years time, you might have near enough a hairless dog that looks like it's got mange. It's not gonna have the same appeal and it's probably burning a hole in your pocket. None of us want that situation. So I think just being level with them is probably your best chance. Which segues nicely into your question. I think. Yeah, I'm coming back to you, Lacey. So how to start a conversation regarding health issues of brachycephalic dogs with their owners without causing offence? Yeah, meet them where they're at. When we assume people don't understand, all we've done is belittle someone. Mm. I am feisty. And if someone comes at me and talks to me like I'm stupid, my walls will go up. Or I'm going to come back at you with another opinion. And it's not going to be an open and progressive conversation. It's actually going to be quite uncomfortable. And no one's going to leave that situation feeling better. And um, what we stand to do is actually push some of our biggest welfare concerns deeper and deeper into unregulated forums with information that's also unregulated and much like a Chinese whisper the good information gets diluted down so we steer away from evidence-based medicine from years of experience both sides of the table lots and lots of breeders do come with some really good advice and anecdotes and actually when we work with them we stand a chance at making good when we push them into a forum, what we're actually doing is denying them a chance to learn. And when you're denied the chance to learn, you're more likely to go and ask someone that, that says, here, let me help. I've got this fertility clinic. It's what I do. It's my speciality. There's no such thing as a specialist fertility clinic in the UK. There is no regulated body that manages that. But a member of the public that hasn't felt they can ask and they can't understand that education because it was never given to them won't know that. They're not a bad person for going to the only place that they thought would help them. And unfortunately, lots of places sell the story very well. What we have to do is work within our code of conduct, which includes looking after our client and members of the public. So actually, by doing our job well, that's how we make a difference. By educating and having open communications, meet people where they're at, people aren't silly, they just may not have an uh, education in this particular area. But judging me by my ability to paint a masterpiece, as Ebony will know, I'm no artist, um, isn't ability in my nursing. And so when we judge a client's ability to understand fertility and breeding, and just that, actually we've discredited everything else we could have taught them. That's not the way to meet someone. Thank you, Lacey. Um, 
to you, Chloe. Um, we hear adopt, don't shop a lot. Uh, we've heard it on VN Happy Hour before uh, more than once. Um, it's obviously a great thing, but is this along with education enough or does more need to be done? I know this is touching on a lot of things we've already been talking about, but is, is that would that be a significant factor in sort of sorting some of these concerns, do you think? Um, I think certainly if you're in a position to adopt it and it suits your lifestyle, it suits what you're looking for and the type of animal you want, then certainly, absolutely. And I think the thing is, nowadays, especially with the surge in all of these designer breeds, all these popular breeds, you can get what you're looking for from an adoption centre. So you just have to be willing to consider that and look into other options. However, I don't think it's fair to push that onto everybody. Not every pet owner is in a position to rehome an animal. Not everyone wants to do that. Not everybody's able to do that. So personally, I think going to somebody and explaining that they can go to a reputable breeder who has that animal's health and well-being as their top priority is probably the better option than just blank out saying, well, no, really, you should be adopting and pushing them into the hands of somebody that's a bit more unscrupulous and is going to give them something that's going to be consumed to long-term health issues and going to cost them some money later down the line. Thanks for that. Rachel, to you. Right, yeah, I'm coming over to you, Catherine. Uh, do veterinary practices do enough to limit the number of C-sections it will undertake on a bitch? Okay, so I can only really speak for the experience I've, you know, of the, of the vets that I've worked with, but I think many, many are uncomfortable um, if they end up doing a second caesarean on a bitch. Um, it, it's not just um, those that choose elective caesareans, but a bitch can have um, an emergency one. You can't help a stuck puppy, you know, nobody can help that. And that may happen. So the breeder may choose to breed again. But if a problem happens again, um, you know, the vets never like going in again because there's always adhesions and it's not, not the best stop. But I don't think there's many of them um, that are comfortable with once they've got two cesareans. And I think that's often when they have a conversation with the owner saying, um, you know, if this has happened again, we don't want to ha happen again in the future. And that's perhaps when they discuss spaying at that second one. So I have never met a vet that just wants to do serial caesareans on a bitch. Um, I don't think that's that's what they want at all. Thank you. And this one's for you, Lacey. Um, what are the potential problems that may arise if clinical settings are less welcoming to brachycephalic breeds? We'll have more of them. <laughs> no, that's not a very helpful answer. Um, Unfortunately, if we're less welcoming, then what we stand to do is um, basically increase demand by not explaining what we're looking at. So, for example, when when I took Dumplin to a gathering of veterinary professionals recently, they were pleasantly surprised that she can close her eyes. That is alarming. The fact that a dog being able to close her eyes is seen as a bonus is alarming and as much as you know that makes me happy that she's a better example we're not talking about that we don't talk about the good examples very much and so in practice if all we're seeing are bad examples and we become blind to it as well because every single one we see is really bad we often forget in the same way as when we see a fit labrador we often forget to say that's a good example when we see the fat Labrador, we say, oh, your lab's a bit chunky. Um, and so with brachycephalics, it's becoming very much the same. It's another brachycephalic. We're becoming blind to the problems because they are there all the time. Most cases now are going to have multiple problems. And so when we make the veterinary clinic less welcoming, because we come with a prejudgment that they will all be bad, and 99% of the time, unfortunately, at the moment they are, but we're not making it better because when someone goes, oh, but my dog is lovely and it's got beautiful temperament and we've not explained what the problems are, what we do is they then go away and we've made a comment on the temperament and nothing else. And so you can be nice and educate. You don't have to say everything is brilliant and be a bad person. So when we make the veterinary clinic more welcoming, 
we can desensitize lots of these animals are going to have lots of problems for life things like horrific ear problems it's very painful and if we can build a better rapport with those clients to teach them how to clean their ears for example then we can improve welfare those patients might not have to be in as much pain we can't fix all of the problems but we can make the welfare that while they're here better and if we don't and it's not welcoming we could add to the breeding problem because no one pointed out it's a problem that shouldn't be passed on thanks for that good answer thanks Lucy. right i'm coming over to you Clary. um how do we tackle unsolicited selling sites offering puppies and kittens on demand so probably the general theme of tonight's conversation education really just like everybody else nobody sat me down when I was little and said this is how you will eventually go out and buy a dog or a cat in a harm-free way and I think you see a lot of it unfortunately in charity and shelter practice people say oh they should know better you know they've met somebody by the side of the road or they've just they found somebody on Gumtree nobody had that conversation with me I found out when I got into this profession so how on earth is somebody out with the profession going to understand that so just explain to them what to look for and what not to look for and there's a selfless plug down the side of all the charity resources that are offered that explain in great detail exactly what is a safe environment to hopefully obtain a puppy or a kitten from and what is not and realistically sometimes it's just easier to explain it in really black and white terms for example people get scammed on Facebook all the time and they they out whoever's trying to sell them something if somebody messages you to say oh two thousand pound white gold ring I'll meet you down at the garage to sell you you go absolutely not no way I'm not taking that chance so saying why would you do that for what you would hope is a long-term family member you just you don't want to take that risk unfortunately there's very rarely anything like a free lunch and if it sounds too good to be true it really likely is it's better to be safe than sorry um and yeah, just explain to them. And I think signposting as well, because half the time when you talk to a client, they're not going to take it all in. Studies have shown using resources, sorry, my cat's just jumped up, <laughs> using resources and giving them something to think about and take away with them really does increase what, what they take away from that conversation as well when they're able to reflect on it and look at it as an afterthought. So I sound like a politician, but it really does all come down to education, 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 doesn't <laughs> yeah. it, really? Um, and just finally, if you all, because we're uh, running out of time for this section, I know our quiz master Jack Pie is uh, itching to get stuck in. Um, so uh, um, just quickly to all of you, I'll start with you, Catherine. Um, your top tip for how VNs beca can become a force for positive change in breed health and education. Okay, so I think a couple of things that um, the other speakers have touched on. I think ideally people need to know what they've got. So um, when that puppy comes in the practice, as I said, please don't go for them. Um, it's supposed to be a nice experience. We want them to come back. But just being honest with, um, you know, what they've got. Uh, today, a colleague said to me, we were talking about colours. And actually, you will often see puppies advertised as carrying certain colours. So that has um, almost put in the mind they are buying a puppy that they can breed from to get these colours. Now there might be lots of other reasons why that puppy shouldn't be bred from and I think we need to help with that um, you know in a, in a, in a nice manner um, but a lot of people won't realise that because the dog's got something they shouldn't really um, you know breed um, if it's something really detrimental. I think educating yourself again, as I said, about the health schemes and tests that are available. Um, and, you know, that's open to, to all dogs. And finally, I think it's really important that um, we in this profession um, engage with breeders and we really help um, foster positive relationships with them. Because if we all care about health and welfare of dogs, then we really need to work together. Um, and that would be my 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 main message there, really. Thank you, Catherine. And um, Lacey, top tip on how VNs can be a force for positive change. Switch your mindset. We got really good at just thinking breeding is bad. While most of us sit on sofas, cuddled up to our dog or cat. The stalk didn't bring them to you. Someone bred them. <laughs> and some breeders are great. 
and some beaters are not great and some are in between and some are mediocre but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try so for me I think it got too easy to say it's the breeders problem they're all doing a really bad job switch your mindset there is so much nurses can do in this area that will have massive and drastic lasting impact on the welfare of the animals that we we took our careers to treat so switch your mindset and try to be more open-minded to be able to meet people where they're at because we might actually have a chance that way great stuff and finally the last word to you clay um i think not in an aggressive manner but kill them with kindness you know people that are going to listen to you i'm glad you finished that sentence <laughs> Right, a car there. Um, yeah, absolutely. People that are willing to listen, people that are reputable um, and passionate about what they do will listen, will take on that feedback, will want to do the best that they possibly can do in that situation. And the others, it's a nice little trick when they go, oh, I'm going to do it anyway, you know, I'm going to take the risk, whatever. And you're like, OK, no problem. Just to make you aware, we start saving now. And you see the cogs turning. What? And I'm like, oh, yeah, they normally go... And uh, lay by it of our wires, it's usually about two to three thousand, and they go, Oh, and you're like, yeah, let's have this conversation again. There's always something that will trigger them to come back and maybe maybe speak to you again. And if that's money, so be it. At least have that conversation. Great stuff. Well, thanks, Chloe, Catherine, and Asa. That was absolutely awesome. Um, yeah. and now something that's even well, just as awesome, the great Jack Pye with his quiz. So um over to you, Jack, and your tiny tortoises. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I hope you weren't all expecting Lee and Nikki, as it said on the sign-up street uh, screen, <laughs> but you have got a younger version, so don't panic. Yeah, it's a lot it's better, okay. Jack. <laughs> and hopefully you can all see this once efforts working okay. Can you see that? If we can. This Great. is getting more high end every time you do it. This I know. Way. There's some Technology. really flashy touches. <laughs> um, but remember, everyone, get get your get your uh, pens and papers out. We need the answers by nine fifteen to this. Yeah. And a cracking prize to the winner. As no well. Over to you, Jack. Sorry, I keep oh, tracking. No out. worries. No, it's fine. So, um, question one is around animals in the news. So this is. Um, specifically in Australia. So what has a patrol of dogs been deployed to protect on an Australian seafront? I'm being quite mean this time as well. I'm not really giving you that many um, multiple choice answers. So it's a bit trickier. But it depends if people have been paying attention to the old news. So what has a patrol of dogs been deployed to protect on an Australian seafront? And we've got Port Patrol there nicely for anyone who's got kids. I'm sure they've heard it many a time. Moving on to question two is animals in the news again. And it's which animal was recently spotted in a river in Nottinghamshire recently, which is a landlocked uh, county as well. So quite an interesting one. That might give you a little tip. There's also some questions coming up, but if you were paying attention to the panel, then you may have a little, little tip as well. I like impressive geography knowledge that you knew Nottinghamshire was landlocked, Jack, as well. Because, uh, Google. <laughs> <laughs> so it's beluga whale, porpoise, beavers, or a seal. So we'll move on to question three, which is which two breeds of dog have been recently banned from being bred in Norway? So however many of you were paying attention. Lacey, I hope you get this one right, being that you answered the question to it. So, which two breeds of dog have been recently banned in from being bred in Norway? That's question three. Moving on, question four is, do you know your numbers and your, your history? And that was, when was the stethoscope first invented? Which year? So, was it 1659, 1796, 1816 or 1899? Nobody's old enough in the group to, um, to know that either. We need Leon, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, 1659, 1796, 1816, or 1899. I'll let you tell him you said that, James. 
No, I'm just banking on that. He's only, I think he's only a year older than me anyway. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm knocking on. But even I don't remember that. <laughs> I'm just going to go and ask Jay next door. Like that. And question five, which is um, everybody's favourite vet, I'm sure. How many episodes of the Super Vet have been aired? So A, 67, B, 85, C, 100, or D, 105? So A67, B85, C100, or D105. Moving on to question six. What was the approximate population of dogs in the UK in 2021 of, so pet-owned dogs? So 12.5 million, 9.6 million, 10.7 million, or 8.4 million, which are all nice massive numbers. You know this one? Yeah. Oh. It's the only one I do know. <laughs> I mean, I went for sandcastles for question one, but um, I don't think that's right. <laughs> A couple of seconds. So 12.5 million, 9.6 million, 10.7 million, or 8.4 million of pet owned dogs in the UK in 2021. So, question seven is what type of crisp is Ed Sheeran's cat named after? So we've got A, Quaver, B, What's It, C, Monster Munch, or D, Dorito. He has got two cats as well, the second one being called Calippo. So is it the, is it the cat he's holding in that picture? Is that his first or his second cat, Jack? Because, I mean, it looks like a What's It, but... <laughs> He looks like a what's it as well, so it's tricky. <laughs> Easy for you to say. I'm not, not, no comment on uh, Ed Sheeran. From me. Don't so, stay me with Sheeran. He's got some cracking tunes at the moment. No comment. Oh, you're not a fan? No. Um, yeah, I'll just leave that there. What's the prize, Rachel, for this quiz anyway? Do we, do we, we didn't really publicise it, did we? So, um, Ooh, I'm going to go no, off the no, cuff no, and no, say no. It's, 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 it's 50 quid, people. So stay involved, 50 pounds mm. on this. So question eight is celebrities again. So which breed of dog does Simon Cowell own? So there's only, only one of those answers is correct, but I've put a few out there just in case it was too, too easy. So A, Dalmatian, B, Labrador Retriever, C, a pug, D, Yorkshire Terrier, E, Beagle, or F, Doberman. Doberman. So I'm giving away all the right answers, I'm sure. That's <laughs> Everyone's got to win. <laughs> so question nine is which animal's social media account is the most popular? So A is Doug the Pug, B is Jif Pom, C is Jill the Squirrel, or D is Nala the Cat. I actually know this one. Hey. Do you? I had a great time looking at all these today. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I've discovered social media accounts I didn't know existed. <laughs> <laughs> so which animal social media account is the most popular? Doug the Pug, Jif Pom, Jill the Squirrel or Nala the Cat? What kind of animals Jif Pom? A Pomeranian. Okay, show my ignorance there. <laughs> so question 10 11 12 and 13 so they're going from top to bottom obviously 10 down there is guess the dog breed from the emojis that are on there oh. <laughs> so some of them are a little equation as you can see so i'll give you a couple of minutes to to guess the dog breeds of these ones might take a bit longer than a simple question. Oh, Remy's stuck on the second one. I think I've got them all already. Oh, yeah. you? Yeah. 
think. I don't know why I'm sounding surprised. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did quite enjoy these. I thought they were quite quite good. Actually, number three, I don't think I've got right. Oh, not so confident. No, not so confident. The uh, the wind just flew out of my sails. I'm deflated. <laughs> I can't win anyway, but it's... Another 15 seconds for these ones. Just uh... and We'll move on to question 14. Right, so moving on is I've never seen this by the way but what are the two breeds of dog in the film The Incredible Journey you've never so, seen it I've never seen it no oh Jack yeah it's a classic it's the same I've never seen Love Actually and I get absolutely ripped for that every time I mention that yeah but... <laughs> when you say it's a classic Rachel I mean it's yeah no actually just, I'm thinking of the latest <laughs> I say the late, the 90s he's... version was it the 90s <laughs> Uh, the incredible journey. But I know the answer to the question. <laughs> so you got to pick two of those answers from the list. So we've got Springer Spaniel, Labrador Retriever, French Bulldog, English Bull Terrier, Border Collie, and a Beagle. So which two were in the film? Someone's dad cried watching it. I, I, mean, I cried, Pippa. I cry every time. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> so moving on to question 15 is what is the collective term for a group of cats? So is it a chowder, B, a crash, C, a basket of cats, or D, a clouder of cats? I didn't know this one, which I think is quite crazy. I feel like I should know this one. And I yeah, don't I feel like I should know it, but yeah. I hope Nikki knows it. Who's on here? The cat lady. Oh, oh yeah. there you go. She knows it. Yeah. <laughs> right on cue. <with> <laughs> so A chowder, B crash, C basket, or D clowder. I didn't even know that was a thing. No. So moving on. Question 17. What would you call a cat with an opposable thumb? As the veterinary term, if it came in. We all love it when a cat comes in with a thumb. You've always got to point it out. And the picture demonstrating. Yeah, excellent, well. excellent picture. So, no idea. moving on. So I think the next one is the tiebreaker question. So this will be the closest number, just in case anyone is on the same score at the end. So... According to the World Canine Organization, how many recognized dog breeds are there in the world? So, how many recognized dog breeds are there in the world? Quite a lot. I do like a good tiebreaker. Yeah. That's, that's probably your best yet, actually, Joe. There's always so much pressure finding a tiebreaker question. <laughs> and like, if someone knows it, like, just easily, which they might well know this one quite easily, but yeah. Well, they've only got till 9.15, so I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone said it was 14 for both 14 and 15. What was that? Oh no, so 14, you need two answers for, for, the, for the one question. And then 15 was the term for a group of cats. And really quickly, if there's anyone who needs any questions, repeat and then just pop them in the chat box, number one. Oh, not me. Uh, it was, what has a patrol of dogs been deployed to protect on an Australian seafront? It's not sandcastles. <laughs> well, it's probably not sandcastles. 
And Gabby wants number two, which is which animal was spotted in a river in Nottinghamshire recently? So a beluga whale, a porpoise, beavers, or a seal? And Kaylee wants number 16. So oh, there isn't a 16. Tell me why. Oh my god, I'm sacked. <laughs> You're on thin ice pie. Um, but uh, I think we'll keep you. I think with the, this, the general standard and gloss of presentation means we can we can over we can overlook that, I think. 16 is a zero. There you go. I've marked it as 60. That's fine. I'm sure we'll we'll work it out on the answers. Yeah. Free point to everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. So that is it. There you that go. Is it? Thank you very much, Thank Jack. You. That oh. was fantastic. Um, so I think um, it's over to you, Rachel, isn't it? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go into some winner announcements now. So we're gonna go for our challenge winner first. And oh my goodness, we had some fantastic entries. Absolutely lovely pictures coming in, and we hopefully should have some coming up on the screen now. Some of the entries. Where's Jack again? It's a lovely picture, but it's not what we're after. Oh, there we go. Here are some of our gorgeous, gorgeous entries. Look at them all. They're just so lovely. It's always really hard picking a winner. Can we guess which one's Jack's picture? <laughs> <laughs> I thought when Jack's picture came up, someone was keeping him as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, and then for our winner, dun, 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 drum roll, here we go. Look at this happy chappy. <laughs> so happy jumping through his ball. I loved it. So congratulations, Suzanne Hall. Absolutely love this picture. Great so stuff. That £50 voucher will be coming to you. And, um, yep. Is yeah, it me now? Is it, it, it me? You, James. Yep, for the top tips. Um, the top tips. Can I have a drum roll, Rachel? You can. Okay, that's enough. Um, first <laughs> winner. Um, we've had to, we, we're always getting dated, but the first winner is Lucy Kells, um, whose top tip is to freeze unused oral rehydration solution into ice cube bags for use with wildlife patients you admit and our second winner is jenna coombs when carrying out weight clicks have bags with certain weights of dried rice in them such as 500 grams and a kilo these can be used to demonstrate how much weight pets have lost and is a great incentive for owners so congratulations to jenna and lucy you're both getting 50 pound vouchers um over to you rachel Right, so now it's about it, pay it forward. I absolutely love pay it forward. You've always got such lovely things to say about each other. It's just always so uplifting to read. And our winner this month is, just wait for the slide to get, there we go. So it's Danny Charlton nominated by Kaylee Harris. Um, so well done, Danny. We're going to put together a lovely little hamper for you that I hope will make you smile. Congratulations. Fantastic. And you've still got a few minutes, guys, um, to get your quiz questions in. Um, I rashly 350 quid at that. So um, that's worth having. Um, we'll, uh, we've got another voucher on its way. So we'll be announcing the winners over socials early next week, I think. Isn't that right, Rachel? For that? Yeah. yeah. Excellent stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that pretty much draws us to a natural conclusion. Um, I would obviously like to thank our sponsors, Bought by Many. Um, I also like to thank our guests. I think you've been absolutely amazing tonight, guys. So that's Chloe, Catherine and Lacey. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. I'd also like to thank um, Remy and Ebony for making sure the whole thing stays propped up for the hour. As per usual, you've done a fantastic job. And I couldn't uh, leave out the incomparable Jack Pie for another amazing quiz. That was brilliant. Um, and our next event, we are coming back. We've not got the theme for it yet because we're, uh, we're busy getting our heads together. But we'd love you to uh, send in your ideas for themes to us. As I say, I say every, every we've been doing this for almost two years now, but it's all about the delegates. It's all about you guys. So any ideas you have for themes, any ideas you have for guests, if you want to come on as a guest, just get in touch with me and Rachel, email the happy hour, email address, ping us on socials, whatever. So that's the 28th of April um, at 8pm. 
Um, so we'll hopefully see all of you next time for another amazing happy hour. But thanks everyone for coming and making. Thank you so much, event. everyone. Thank you.